Dungeons & Dragons, no matter what the developers say, is really designed for four-person parties. You can stretch the numbers up or down, and the game still functions and is tons of fun, but the numbers don't necessarily stretch with you all that well, and management at the table can be a real pain. But at the same time, we're dealing with a couple of other constraints. For one, the idea of corralling five, six, seven, or more of our family or friends and keeping them focused on the game, uh, feeling like they're getting their own uh, spotlight time and that they're engaged and some kind of cohesive unit uh, feels almost impossible. And yet telling somebody in our friend group, oh, sorry, John, but we don't have room for you at the table uh, doesn't feel good. If that doesn't bother you to tell people to just go kick rocks, then, you know, maybe therapy? Anyway, uh, today our question brought to us by Mitch is regarding how to manage groups of five or more players and what we actually need to do to adjust numbers and our style of play to manage those kinds of larger groups. Thanks so much, Mitch, for the question, and thank you to our Tank Class supporters who decide what I get to muse on so that we can talk about Dungeons & Dragons and get a little better at our game. Why is five plus people a lie? Uh, when you're trying to design something, it's typical for us to take into account the information that we already have available. As home brewers of many things uh, to, uh, that most dungeon masters are, when it comes to uh, putting things into play at our table, we unconsciously or hopefully consciously take into account the characters that we're dealing with, the players and their proclivities, and all of that sort of information. While when you're designing a game from a designer standpoint, you have to come up with some kind of uh, prototype or prototypical uh, archetype of group and Dungeons and Dragons has always done just that with a four-man group of a fighter type, a rogue type, a magician, and a cleric of some sort, a divine caster. And this has been the case for as long as Dungeons & Dragons has been a thing, and it uh, provides a framework by which the game is designed. It allows you to put things into play that are going to test each of these archetypes, and it allows you to balance your numbers around the kind of output that these creatures could have. However, when you throw a fifth or a sixth creature into the game, uh, the only way that you could properly account for this would be to redesign the encounters to account for every permutation of this kind of situation. Since we have 13 different classes in Dungeons & Dragons, if you don't count Blood Hunter, which I don't, then you're looking at a ton of different permutations that are just too many to truly take into account. And so the four-man party has always been the standard, and probably always will be. And that's okay, but because it's a standard and not necessarily what happens at the table, we do need to take it into account when we start adjusting things by increasing the number of players at our table. And I feel like the system didn't do necessarily a great job of doing that. I do agree with it that uh, when you step up into a six-person table, uh, you are definitely decreasing the difficulty of encounters, which the challenge rating system tries to account for. But unfortunately, the synergy that happens between characters in a group, particularly once you add uh, an extra of any of the four major arc types, uh, that synergy just throws the balance way more out of whack than what the CR system seems to indicate. Uh, I would say that adding a fifth player uh, almost immediately drops the challenge of a situation down by one setting of the challenge rating system, but even then it doesn't really make things more calculatable in, in that way. So I, I wouldn't even worry about that. Just keep in mind that at about six players, difficulty of any situation is halved. 
And by the time you get up to having an eight player table, you've trivialized things by making it more like a quarter of the difficulty that it was before. Even though the numbers to math doesn't work out, the synergy and action economy makes a big difference on that. One of the reasons for that is because every time you add another player into the initiative role of a combat situation, you are increasing the odds that somebody with an ability that is going to completely change the battlefield uh, in the favor of the party beats your monsters. And for some reason, Wizards gives very little love to monsters when it comes to having a decent initiative. And so it's pretty common that your players have worked out that this is the most important role in the game and have specialized in some manner in getting a good initiative for their group and then your monsters all end up going last if they even live long enough to go at all. When it comes to adjusting for large player sizes, there's pretty much two aspects that you need to take care of. One is the management of the players themselves and the other is the numbers. So in addition to uh, realizing that your fights are being trivialized when you increase the numbers, you have to adjust things to keep up with that. Uh, it's pretty common for DMs to fall into the trap of adding extra creatures so that they match the number of players at the table. In fact, there's a bunch of published adventures that suggest you have X monsters where X is equal to one plus the number of players that are at your table. But this increases the duration of your battles, but not necessarily the tension of your battles. The other option is to increase the amount of hit points that a creature has so that it lives long enough to get a couple of rounds of its actions in. However, because its actions are still only enough to threaten the same amount as it would in a four-man group, what you're doing is extending the duration of the kill without increasing the threat that the monster poses, and that threat has been trivialized by the addition of more and more creatures uh, on the player side of the battle. So instead of increasing hit points or increasing the number of creatures at the table, things that you can do that actually make things more manageable is increasing the damage output that your creatures are going to put out and increasing their chances for getting to take a turn. This can be either done by increasing the initiative or if you have a group that has monsters that has multiple uh, people involved, having some of them off field that can join in or in hidden locations that can pop up so that they don't act until their initiative comes around and then they get to join into the battlefield can be a much more impactful way to add tension. Reinforcements coming on the field always ratchets things up and if the damage that is being dealt is enough to cause a real threat then it makes it more likely that that encounter is going to run swiftly as you dish massive damage to one target, everybody rallies together and kills that creature before it can take another attempt and knock somebody down. That's a much more tense encounter, even if it only lasts for one cycle of the initiative, than a three initiative slog that took all three rounds for you to put that first character into any kind of danger by just increasing the hit points of your monster. The other side of things uh, in the numbers game is when you're dealing with solo monsters. Solo creatures with legendary actions and legendary resistances are clearly designed for four-man groups. Just take a look at how a battle should go if you've got three legendary actions and four players. Let's say that the monster wins initiative. He acts first then a player acts, then I take a legendary action, then a player, legendary, player, legendary, player, monster's turn again. Every time that the tension switches because the monster did something powerful, the player gets to switch it back by taking their own attempt. And then we switch back and forth and back and forth over and over to keep the tension constantly shifting and keep it and because of that, rising and feeling like the pace is really good and the encounter feels good. However, the moment you add an extra finger in here and you put two people back to back with nothing happening in between, then the pace starts to feel a little bit more uh, 
shifted and doesn't work out quite as well. Uh, whereas you can control your pacing by using creatures' larger number of legendary actions when something doesn't go in the player's favor. Maybe they miss on their attack roll, and so instead of taking a monster turn, you net let another player go, they deliver a massive blow, and so then you use two legendary actions in this space. It's clearly designed with a four-man group in mind and gives you a lot of uh, tools to manage the pacing and tension of your uh, encounter, but as soon as you add a fifth person, it all goes to heck. So, I add an extra legendary action for every creature after, for every player after four players. Five guys, that's four legendary actions. Six, then it's five. And I also increase the number of legendary resistances by one for every two people after a four-man group. So that you can't just in one round completely burn through all the resources of the monster and pin it down and kick its butt unless you get extremely lucky. Those natural 20s on your rolls and the natural ones on the monsters are already increasing tension. And so if the players have a run of good luck and your monster ends up with all its legendary resistances burned and then is incapacitated, the dice have created the tension where the encounter couldn't do it on its own. But if it's just a bunch of uh, meager rolls and you've got six or eight guys to try and get rid of only three resistances, then it's the, the tension just doesn't work quite the same way. The other aspect is managing the players at the table, and that's mostly a matter of making sure that you are shifting the spotlight appropriately uh, around the people that are in the group. You can use uh, sort of a playoff of the initiative system in order to have everybody's names listed up and work your way around. One good way to manage that is to ask each person for their intentions uh, around the table, what they want to do in any given situation, even if it's not a combat situation, and then resolve those actions in the order that they would naturally finish in. So if somebody wants to start something that's going to take 10 minutes, ask everybody else what they're doing during those 10 minutes and find a way to resolve the fastest actions first, ask for more actions, and keep resolving until you get back to that 10 minute action and you resolve that. Once you've resolved that 10 minute block, start again and work your way around. By by making sure that everybody has a chance to answer what they're doing and then finding ways to uh, to capitalize and yes and on what they choose, then you create a pretty decent opportunity for everybody to get the spotlight. Another way you can do it without calling everybody out and worrying quite that finitely on the, the time frame and working your way is to write down everybody's names on a 3 by 5 card and whenever somebody has a spotlight moment, a moment where they get to shine or where they get to uh, spend a fair amount of time talking and acting and doing something, give them a tick mark uh, next to their name and after a little while, when you see that there's somebody who hasn't got a tick mark, but somebody's got a couple of tick marks, start finding a way to call on that person to act in a situation and give them opportunities to take a little bit of that spotlight for themselves. Another thing you can do is to focus people, uh, particularly in combat situations, by giving them a time limit to declare their actions. It's important that you differentiate declaring actions with resolving actions. A lot of people talk about having them roll all their dice beforehand while it's somebody else's turn, or having them take care of their entire action in a 60 second span of time and take care of all the dice and their decisions and everything. But part of the problem that I have with both of those approaches is that they are not always realistic and sometimes they invalidate the situation that's at hand. Some players need more time because they've got more dice to roll or some players need more input on what's happening before they can actually make their decision. When you ask somebody to figure out all of their turn and take their dice rolls before it's their turn, you're effectively asking them not to pay attention to what everybody else is doing, which is somewhat antithetical to them then being able to make appropriate actions on their turn and role play what their character is experiencing. 
you want them to pay attention to what's happening and then quickly decide on their turn what they're going to do. And then you can transition from that into them resolving it. It does still take a little bit longer because they save the decision making until their turn actually rocks up, but it allows them to be more invested in their turn and gives everybody else the same opportunity to be invested in other people's turns. And I just feel that it runs better at the table than trying to have people ignore one another or putting this artificial constraint that works great on, say, the barbarians to attack rolls, but then when the uh, fighter rolls around and attempts to resolve four attacks plus an attack through his echo plus an action surge, four attacks and another attack through his echo, uh, all of that sometimes takes just a little bit longer than two attacks with your barbarian and jumping into your rage. Mitch, I hope that this has been helpful and has answered some of the question that you posed, and uh, thank you for posing it. Thank you again to the Tank Class supporters, and remember, if you have any kind of thing that you would like me to muse on, all you have to do is leave a comment and I will add it to our queue. But if you want to tell me what to do and tell me what I'm going to muse on, then you need to hit the join button down here and become a Tank Class supporter yourself. Thanks so much for watching, have a great day, and happy adventuring.